Um, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, efficient algorithms for deep learning or maybe I should read it efficient algorithms for deep learning question mark uh, because most of this talk will be about um, uh, open problems and hardness results and uh, few very very few um, positive results. Um, okay. This does not work. So this also does not work. Now it works. So quickly, what, what is a neural network? Uh, let's start with a single neuron. Um, a single neuron uh, has um, uh, inputs in this picture, five features, and then it has weights, V1 to V5. Um, then we just take the inner product between V and X, and uh, this gives us a scalar and we pass this scalar through an activation function, sigma, which is a function from R to R. Usually uh, it is uh, a sigmoidal function, um, like here. Um, now, uh, to construct a neural network, you just stack together many, many neurons. So you um, um, wire the output of uh, neurons to the input of uh, other neurons in the network. Uh, I'm focusing on uh, feed-forward networks in which there are no loops in this graph, okay? Um, in, this, uh, in this picture, uh, there, it is a layered network, so the input to neuron here comes from the previous layer, but it's not necessarily so. Um, I will also talk about other types of uh, networks, okay? Um, so why do, should we care about uh, deep neural networks? Um, the first explanation, and actually this is uh, the reason I started to think about uh, neural networks, is because uh, some guy A uses it to do some task B, and you should put in A and B whatever you like. Um, <laughs> but uh, maybe this is uh, not a sufficient uh, explanation. So there are classic exp explanations because neural networks are here for a while. Um, and the, cl the classic explanation is that uh, neural networks are universal approximators. This means that uh, every function uh, under Lipschitz assumption um, can be approximated by a neural network. So in a sense, uh, they are very powerful. Um, but this explanation is not convincing. Um, why? So the first reason it is not very difficult to show that um, for this uh, classic exp explanation, you need a network of exponen exponential size. So there is no network of polynomial size that can uh, approximate every function, okay? So why should we care about networks of exponential size? We should not care about such networks. These are too large for our needs. Um, and if we're talking about universal approximators, then there are many other universal appro approximators all of them will be exponential in D. Um, so in my opinion, universality is not interested at all, but uh, this is another story. Um, so uh, we have nearest neighbor boosting other, so why should we care about neural networks in particular? So before I'm, I, I will talk about uh, how to train neural networks, I want to give a few slides about um, why I think that deep neural networks are great uh, from a statistical learning perspective. Okay, so, so in, in statistical learning, uh, our goal is to learn a function h from some domain x. Uh, I will focus on d-dimensional vector spaces uh, to, to some output y. Let's talk um, about a binary problem, so y is just 0, 1. And uh, the input to the learning algorithm is a, a training set of m examples, m per example. Now, famous uh, no free lunch theorem says that any algorithm a and for any sample size m, there is some word uh, defined by a distribution d over the product distribution of x and y, uh, and some target function h star, such that h star is very, very good with respect to d. So the word is uh, predictable, but the algorithm will uh, fail. If the algorithm uh, receives a training set of uh, m examples, uh, its output will be a very bad predictor with respect to d. Okay, so the problem is not difficult. There is some H star which is very good, but the algorithm will fail. Um, and how we circumvent this uh, no free lunch? Um, um, so we, we must have some 
a bias or prior knowledge about the problem we are, we are trying to solve, and we bias the learner toward reasonable functions. And one way to uh, express this is by a hypothesis class H, which is, which is just a subset of all functions from X to Y, and we focus on learning just um, such functions. And now the question is, what should be H? How, do, how, should, we do, how should we bias ourselves? Um, so here is the first idea. Uh, recently, David McAllister wrote it in his blog. Uh, so let, let me define H++ to be all function we can implement in C++ using code lengths of at most B bits, where B is a parameter. Uh, and then with sufficiently large B, H++ uh, is excellent uh, set of functions because we, almost whatever we want to, to have, we can implement in C++ using B bits. Okay? Um, and the sample complexity, meaning how many examples we need to learn this class, uh, is nice. We, it behaves like a B over epsilon square. So um, if we want accuracy epsilon, we just need B over epsilon square examples. This is very easy to prove. Um, and the learning algorithm is also very simple here. It's just empirical risk minimization. So we just need to find some C++ program uh, that has minimal error on the training set. And that's it. I mean, this is what we want to learn. This is how to learn it. And it, it is the end of the story. Of course, the problem is a computational barrier. So computationally, we have no idea how to uh, find a C++ program uh, that works well on the training set we, we got. Okay? So the reason to talk about other hypothesis classes is mainly because of this computational bar barrier. Otherwise, this is an ultimate solution to our problem. Uh, so let's uh, take uh, another approach. Uh, consider all the functions over a binary, but it's also true for non-binary um, spaces that can be executed in time of at most t of d. d is a dimension, t of d is a time where we allow ourselves for our predictors to run, okay? So again, um, with sufficiently large t of d, this is an excellent class because uh, we want to learn functions that we can run fast, okay? And you define what is fast by t of d, okay? So it's not a, a big restriction to learn just this um, class. Now, uh, it is not very difficult to show that the class of neural networks of depths uh, O of t of d uh, and size O of t of d square uh, contains all functions that can be executed on a Turing machine in time uh, T of D. So neural networks in that sense is a great hypothesis class because again, like the C++ thing we, before, it enables us to learn efficiently, not efficiently, but to learn all the things that we can actually run, okay, so which is what we should care about. And the sample complexity, again, a classic result, uh, appears in the book of uh, Peter Bartlett and uh, from 1999. Um, so the sample complexity behaves nicely. It depends uh, linearly or quadratically on the size of the network. So everything is, again, great. Um, so this is why we should care about uh, neural networks. <coughs> of course, as before, we have, we have a problem how to train neural networks. So we know how to learn uh, from the statistical point of view, just find a good neural network in the sense that it behaves nice, nicely over the training set. But how can we find such neural network? Um, so uh, I hope I convinced you that neural networks are great statistically, uh, but the computational barrier is annoying. So it is uh, known that it, uh, it is hard to learn neural networks to implement empirical risk minimization is, is NP hard and in, even to approximate it is NP hard, uh, and even with very simple networks of just two layers and uh, three hidden, um, hidden not layers, hidden neurons uh, in the single hidden layer. Um, sorry? For what loss function? Even square loss. Yes, even, even for convex loss function. Okay. Um, and even in the separable case. So everything is in your favor and still it is NP hard. Uh, so what people do, uh, usually back propagation, which is gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, 
uh, possibly with some unsupervised pre-training and other bells and whistles. Uh, but all these methods, uh, while they uh, sometimes work nicely in practice, they have no theoretical guarantees and it follows that uh, if you want to implement it yourself, you need a lot of manual work. Okay, so after this long introduction, um, this talk is about attempts to circumvent the hardness of learning neural networks. And I will talk about uh, three ideas. Uh, the, the first idea is, a, is an idea that Jan LeCun uh, told me about uh, um, in over some dinner. Uh, it calls uh, the idea of overspecification. Uh, and I will show one result that uh, overspecification uh, works in the sense that it, if you extremely overspecify the network, then you can eliminate local minima. Uh, but then I will show a very strong hardness result um, showing that um, you need a, an extreme overspecification and then you lose statistically. So uh, there is no clever trick to make uh, the overspecification work by itself. So we need another idea. And the second idea is to change the activation function. So recall that in neural network we have inner product with some weights and then activation function, usually taken to be a sigmoidal function. So maybe we can change the activation function to be some simpler nonlinear function. And I will talk about the square function, it, which is maybe the simplest nonlinear activation function. I will show a positive result, a, an efficient algorithm for learning some product networks. So these, these networks are just some intake product because activation function is square. Uh, so depth two and small size, uh, some product networks, I will show an efficient algorithm for learning them. This is already a nice achievement because in the sigmoidal, sigmoidal function, sigmoidal activation function, I will show you hardness result even for uh, two layers and very few number of uh, hidden neurons. Okay. On the other hand, I will show that if you want a deeper, much deeper, uh, some product networks, it is still very hard to learn them. So we need another idea. So the, the, the last idea is just imposing some distributional assumptions. And uh, I will present some work about uh, distributional assumptions that the classes lies on algebraic sets. Okay, so let's start with the first idea, over specification. So uh, Jan LeCun uh, told me about the following experiments that, uh, that uh, he did. Uh, you fix a network architecture uh, and generate data according to this network. So you know that the network comes exactly from some simple neural network. Now you uh, try to uh, apply back propagation in order to recover the parameters of the, wet uh, of the network uh, using the generated data. So this uh, fails, doesn't work. But if you enlarge the network size, you take a larger network, and then you try to run backpropagation to fit the parameters of the largest, uh, of the larger network, and you only care not about uh, recovering the original network, you just care about having good performance, then this works, okay? So the idea here is to, to learn larger networks. Maybe we will need some more data to learn these larger networks, but maybe this uh, will help us to circumvent the hardness result. Okay, so the, the question is maybe we can, we can efficiently learn your, uh, neural networks using over-specification. Um, so the first, uh, I was thinking about it, and the first uh, uh, thing that, uh, um, that we came up is that extreme over-specification actually can give you a lot. Uh, so um, if you have a data matrix of uh, M examples in D dimension, and then you take any uh, network with uh, uh, capital N internal neurons, V be all the weights in the network except the weights for the last layer. And then uh, F V of X will be the evaluation of the network, uh, all the, all the uh, internal neurons of the network over the data matrix. Okay, so this will be a matrix F, okay? 
Uh, and W be the weights of the last layer. Uh, so we will predict uh, by taking uh, W times F. Um, OK, so the theorem tells you that if you over-specify to the level that the number of uh, hidden neurons is greater than or equal to the number of examples, and under some mild conditions on F that holds, for example, if we take sigmoidal activation functions, then the optimization problem of uh, finding the weights W and V, these are many, many weights, to minimize a square error over the data, has no local non-global minima. So what, what do I mean? There are many, many, many local minima. Um, so th there are many, many minima. So the, this is something like this. Uh, but all the local minima are also global minima. OK? So uh, this is promising because then we can just apply any gradient descent algorithm and find some local minima. And then we know that we also have the global minima at hand. Uh, and the idea of the, uh, the proof is first to, so to show that uh, some with high probability over small perturbations of uh, the parameters V, then the matrix F V over X has full rank. Um, once you have a matrix, so th this means that uh, the points in which F has full rank are dense. And then uh, if you are in such a V, then you can just play with W, with the weights of the last layer, and obtain, um, and you can find the direction that will decrease the objective. Meaning that uh, if you cannot find the direction, you must be in the uh, global minimum. Okay? Um, so this is very nice, but of course it has a, a big uh, problem. The number of uh, neurons here is uh, greater uh, then the greater or equal to the number of examples. So statistically, uh, these, such networks will lead to overfitting. Okay, overfitting, if our problem is overfitting, may maybe there is some clever way to eliminate overfitting uh, like regularization or people in neural networks propose dropouts or many, many other ideas. Uh, so maybe there is some trick that uh, will eliminate uh, uh, this problem. So um, what I'm going to show you is that there is no such trick in the general case. So without more assumptions, no such tricks will work uh, always. Uh, so the theorem is that even if the data is perfectly generated by a neural network of depth 2 and with only little omega of 1 hidden neurons, there is no algorithm that can achieve small test error. Okay, so this is a very strong hardness result. It means that over specification, dropout, regularization, all such attempts are doomed to fail unless we make more assumptions. Um, okay, so uh, how do we prove uh, such a strong negative result? The idea is to use a uh, hardness result for improper learning. So we can think about the class of neural networks with uh, two layers and, um, and little omega of one hidden neurons. This is a hypothesis class. And then uh, we can ask if there is some algorithm that can learn it using improper, uh, uh, improper uh, learning. And what is improper learning? I will come to it in a moment. Um, OK, I, I will come to it now. Uh, improper learning is that the learner tried to, to learn some hypothesis H star, H star from H. In our case, H, uh, capital H would be uh, the class of neural networks of uh, depth 2 and little omega of 1 um, hidden neurons. But the learner is not restricted to output a hypothesis from H. He can build a larger network, over-specify, do whatever he wants. The, the algorithm can do everything. Uh, it just uh, must uh, output a predictor which good uh, test error, okay? This is the only requirement. So how do we show hardness for, uh, for improper learning? Um, so the, the technical novelty in, uh, in this lower bound is a new method for de deriving lower bounds for improper learning. It rely, relies on assumptions on average case complexity as opposed to cryptographic assumptions which were used heavily before. 
And this technique actually yields new hardness results for uh, other problems like learning DNFs, which is an open problem since, say, 1989. Uh, intersection of little omega of one of half spaces, which immediately gives a result for neural networks. Uh, it also helps for agnostically learning half space, so it is hard to find a constant approximation function for agnostically learning half spaces. All of this comes from the same technique of uh, proving hardness results using average case complexity. But I will not talk about it more. I will just uh, mention another corollary of these uh, hard new hardness results for uh, problems of uh, establishing computational statistical trade-offs. This is probably something that uh, you heard uh, here before, maybe in one of Mike's talks. Um, so uh, in an upcoming NIPS paper, uh, we show that for the problem of agnostically learning half spaces over sp three sparse vectors, you have the following picture. So um, statistically, you can learn this problem with order of D examples, where D here is a dimension, but uh, the naive algorithm takes exponential time. Now, we show that if you have less than D to the power of 1.5 examples, then no algorithm can learn it in polynomial time. You must have super polynomial time. But once you have D square examples, then suddenly you can learn it in polynomial time. And uh, so this result is, uh, as far as I know, the first that show it for non-synthetic problem and together with uh, lower bounds. So all, all of here is D over epsilon square. So I just ignore the dependence on epsilon. Fix your epsilon. So in, in this graph, you fix epsilon. You fix it, the target epsilon, and then show this graph. OK? OK, so the first idea of over-specification is nice, but doesn't work. So we need uh, other ideas and maybe com combine them together. So the second idea is to change the activation function. And what I will show is that together with the first idea of over-specification, you, you now can learn uh, small neural networks, neural networks of depth 2, and a um, small number of uh, hidden neurons. Uh, but I will show that if you want deep neural networks of uh, um, the new activation function, it is still hard. OK. So what is some product networks? The idea is to, to have simpler nonlinearity. Instead of sigmoidal function as activation function, we will take sigma of A to be just A squared. OK. Um, so such networks, all that what they do is sum things and take product of things. This is why they, they are called sum product networks. And summing and multiplying is uh, actually the way we calculate polynomials. So such networks learn polynomials. Um, the size of the networks, the, um, the size of the networks as measured by the number of neurons determines, determines the generalization properties and the evaluation time of the network. So we want uh, to efficiently learn polynomial networks of small size. So let's start with uh, the smallest uh, depth possible. Uh, which is not trivial, uh, depth two polynomial network. So what we have, we, we have the input layer, then the hidden layer calculate v time x square, and then the last layer is just linear function over the hidden layer, okay? So these are the uh, simplest possible uh, non-trivial uh, sum product networks. So can we learn these networks? Um, so what is the hypothesis class? Uh, X is mapped to uh, some function that depends on two sets of parameters, lambdas and v's, where, where the vi's are vectors and the lambdas are scalars. It can be shown that uh, ERM finding the best uh, such uh, hypothesis over the training set is still NP-hard, even though we are with much simpler nonlinearity. But I will show you that here over specification works. So if you allow me to learn slightly larger networks, then I can find a good network efficiently. Uh, so 
uh, the trivial thing to do is just take d square hidden neurons that will just take all the products x, i, x, j of two inputs. Then uh, it is trivial that it contains the original network because this is a uh, second degree polynomial. So if you allow all monomials of second degree, of course you can learn this. Uh, but this leads to uh, two large networks. The, the size of the networks will be uh, d square. The question is, can we do better? So we want something that will be uh, roughly the same order of, uh, of the number of hidden neurons. Uh, so you can do much better by adapting some greedy algorithm. So here is the algorithm. You maintain a matrix V and a vector lambda. The columns of V will be this VI that defines the, the hidden neurons, and lambda will be the weights of the, of the last layer. Um, okay, so uh, you do it in steps. At each step, you add one more hidden neuron. Um, so on, on step T, uh, you first define this matrix M. Um, this matrix M, you can think about it as uh, some gradient matrix of the, predict of the current predictor. Uh, now, um, if you find the uh, largest eigenvector of the matrix M, so the greedy step is you want a large gradient. So you can think about it uh, like in uh, Peter, uh, Peter's talk about coordinate descent, but now we have infinite number of coordinates, and the coordinates are uh, parameterized by all the vectors all the vectors, uh, all the unit vectors in RD. So finding the largest, uh, uh, the largest coordinate corresponding to finding the leading eigenvector of M, then you get a smaller problem of uh, fitting a small matrix B uh, and minimizing the loss over it. This is a convex optimization problem of small size, so it can be solved easily. And finally, we, you take, uh, you decompose uh, B2 eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and you construct lambda and V out of it and iterate. And then the analysis is that uh, if, uh, uh, the, if, if there is a good small networks, a network of size R, where uh, the size of the lambda I are order of one, then if you over-specify, then take a network of size R square, so square the number of hidden uh, neurons is the over-specification, then the output of Gecko will be good. Uh, so here is an example where overspecification helps. Okay. Um, what about uh, high, high degree polynomials? What about uh, depth three? So it's still open. I don't know to say much. I can tell you uh, in a theorem that uh, if you want very, very uh, deep networks like of, of uh, depth polynomial in D, then this will, would be hard. But <coughs> other constant or log d, it's still open. Uh, let me rush to the last uh, thing because I have five more, uh, two more minutes. Okay, two more minutes. Um, so the last idea is distributional assumptions. And um, of course, uh, the major question is what are reasonable distributional assumptions? So here is one distributional assumption. I'm not sure it's the most reasonable one, but it's something. Um, so uh, the idea is that we will assume that the set of positive and negative points are at least approximately lie on different algebraic sets. So what is an algebraic set? It's just a solution of a set of polynomial equations. So here there is an ellipse that defines an equation for the uh, blue and for the red different ellipse, okay? So assuming the data is lies on two different <coughs> algebraic manifolds, can we train a deep network that classifies the data? And in some sense, the answer is yes. And the algorithm is called vanishing component analysis. Um, very quickly, I will, uh, I, I don't have time to explain the algorithm, but uh, um, very quickly, maybe I will just say that we find two sets of, uh, of uh, polynomials. Um, one set of polynomials uh, gives us all the polynomial behaviors over the data. So this gives us a representation of all possible pol polynomial behaviors over the data. The other set gives us uh, the ideal or all possible 
give us some good representation of all polynomials that vanishes on the data. And just with these two small sets of polynomials, we can express uh, the classification between the two algebraic sets. But unfortunately, I ran out of time, so I will skip the vanishing component analysis part. Um, I'll just uh, mention maybe very briefly the, the analysis. So what we build is a set uh, F1 to Ft and V1 to Vt, and we show that every polynomial P of degree D can be written as G plus H, where G is in the span of these polynomials, and H is in the ideal generated by these polynomials. So we have a good small representation for all possible uh, things that we want to know on this data, and from this we can build a classification for the two uh, sets. Okay, uh, I don't have time to compare it to polynomial kernels, so let me just uh, summarize. Uh, so deep networks are really great, statistically, uh, but uh, cannot be trained efficiently, and I think that's the main open problem uh, for more rigorous study of, of uh, neural networks is how to find a combination of network architecture and distributional assumptions that are useful in practice and lead to efficient algorithms. And what I showed you is just few attempts. Um, I would like to uh, thank my collaborators. So the SIG for efficient algorithms for deep learning is joint work with uh, Ohad Shamir. Uh, the Gecko algorithm, the greedy algorithm is together with Alon Gonen, a student of mine, and Dohad Shamir, but it is based on a previous paper with Tong uh, Zhang that is sitting here and Natis Rebro. Um, the vanishing component analysis is together with Roy Livni, David Lehavi, Hilana Khlieli, Sagish Chain, and Amir Globerzon. And the uh, lower bounds are joint work with a student of, uh, joint student of myself and Nati Lineal, Amit Danieli. Uh, so thank you for listening. So the guarantee is that um, I will just yeah. So the, the guarantee is uh, correctness in this mean usefulness is that if the if the data lies on different uh, algebraic sets, then you can construct features just based on these sets F and V that classify separates the data. Um, so, so, so uh, just a second. So, so the efficiency here is that the number of polynomials in the worst case will be at most polynomial in the number of examples n in D. Uh, the, the, the problem here is statistical usefulness. So if you happen to find something with uh, little o of m uh, components, that then you are fine. But can, you guarantee, can we guarantee that always you can find a little o of m um, features? No. And a good question here is when can you guarantee? We have some, uh, some conditions, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm still not happy with these conditions. But this is a very good question. Okay, let's thank Shai again. Thank you. And